In the Lord I take refuge. Our circumstances, we, we, uh, we start to see them going wrong. We tell ourselves, well, as soon as I can get through this phase, then I'll be all right. Well, hey, once I get that next paycheck, once I get over this sickness, once my kids get out of diapers, then, then I'll, be, I'll be all right. It seems like sometimes it's so hard to actually take refuge in the Lord. And what does that even mean, really? When, like, every circumstance is going wrong. Like, when you really, really want to take refuge in the Lord, but you're not really sure how. You're not really sure what it means. Maybe your marriage is failing. Maybe your kids are failing. Maybe you are in difficult work or a financial situation that is desperate. Perhaps you are sick and something is going on with your body that you cannot control. You are undergoing suffering. And you're saying to yourself, I, I want to take refuge in the Lord. I, I need to take refuge in the Lord. If I don't take refuge in the Lord, something bad is going to happen. How do I take refuge in the Lord? Maybe you're caught in some kind of a mental trap. Perhaps the enemy has been grinding away on you for years and years and you feel like you're about to be crushed. Perhaps you have faced your own death or the death of a loved one. And you're so lost in grief, you're not sure how you can take refuge in the Lord. Maybe you've gone through a miscarriage. You're lost in depression. Stuck in destructive relationships that you just can't seem to fix. Maybe you're caught in substance abuse or sexual abuse. Or you're haunted by those half-remembered nightmares. How do we take refuge in the Lord? Because David just says it so boldly here. In the Lord I take refuge. After meditating on this psalm, I want to sort of grab David by the lapels, reach through the text into history and shake him a little bit and say, How? Well, listen, this morning I, I think we have something to learn from this psalm about how we can take refuge. But before we do, we need to look at this accusation. There seems to be a scoffer in David's life. Perhaps someone in the royal court. Maybe a false prophet. Doesn't really matter. For us, it could be our, our own mind. But, but really, I, I like to think of it as either just straight up the devil saying this. Or... Someone who's not of faith, who's kind of smug about it. You know what I mean? I see all this stuff going wrong in my life, and I'm crying out to the Lord. I'm desperate, and I'm trying to take refuge, but it just doesn't seem to be working. And this, David says, how can you say to my soul, to this person, this, this scoffer, this, this accuser, flee like a bird, to your mountain. See, oftentimes, people of faith are painted. This caricature is painted of us. Like there's the real world, and when we take refuge in the Lord, what we're doing is fleeing like a bird, flapping our wings up into the sky, way, way, way away from the real world, up to this far-off mountain where God is, because God's not here, not in this midst, not in all of these troubles. Flee like a bird to your mountain. Now, the mountain is God's holy mountain, Jerusalem, where the temple is. That's where God is. It's it's far off. It's not in real life to this accuser. So they're saying, 
In the midst of all of this trouble, David is proclaiming, I, in the Lord I take refuge. And this scoffer is saying, flee like a bird to your mountain. Then he gives an explanation. It's not for no reason. There's these scientific facts here. Face reality. For behold, look, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. I just want to, there's this evil, these evil people. They've, they've got the arrow fitted to the string. It's, the bow is bent. There are enemies of the righteous person who's trying to take refuge in the Lord, but, but the Lord seems far off and those arrows are pretty pointy. What's God going to do? How can he deliver you from that? But what's really interesting is the setting in which both the righteous person is and the wicked people are in the dark. How, how can you tell a righteous person in the dark? Thought about this. How can you tell? If, uh, if you're on your front porch, the sun has gone down, and all of a sudden you see someone at the corner of your yard, how would you know if they were righteous or bent on evil intent? Well, here's what I think. I think if they've got a flashlight and they're shining things around, you're probably all right. If they're creeping around in the shadows, not letting themselves be known, they don't want to be seen, probably up to no good. I think that implicit in this text is the fact that the righteous person in the dark is shining a light. Because otherwise, there's no danger. If we shut off all of the lights in here, and you all had bows and arrows, and I said, ready, go. The lights clicked off, and I ducked behind the pulpit, and you guys could shoot freely. What would be the likelihood of you hitting me? Almost none. Because you can't aim. You don't know where I'm at. There's dark everywhere. But if I'm shining a light, if I'm holding my light out, then it's pretty easy, isn't it? Because you, you have this point of light in the midst of the darkness. You just point the arrow at that thing and let it loose. And so this is why the scoffer has some ground to stand on here. Flee like a little bird to your mountain. Because these wicked people are all around the place, so desperate to tear the righteous person down. It's dark, and the righteous person seems to have the kind of a choice here to extinguish their light or not. Worse is verse number three. Not only is the upright person a target, but the very place that they might find refuge uh, behind the walls, perhaps of the temple or the palace. They've all been laid low. There's not even a foundation there. The very foundations have been destroyed. If the foundations are destroyed, if there is no wall to hide behind, what can the righteous do? It's a question that that the scoffer assumes an answer to. It's a rhetorical question. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Nothing. So run off. I, I think about the movie The Lord of the Rings, and, and you, you know that spot where Gandalf is standing on, on the skinny little bridge and the Balrog is coming and all the... And he's holding him off with his, with his light on his staff and he's standing in the middle of the thing and, and then the Balrog comes and he's getting overwhelmed and he turns to the, to the other guys in the fellowship and he says, fly you fools! And then boom, he's, and the guys are running off and I think, I think that's basically what the scoffer is saying, like run away. I, I think one other example, I, I think of good old Snake Plissken in the movie Escape from L.A. And this is kind of an oldie, but Kurt Russell plays this man-of-the-world gunslinger. 
and, uh, and he's got to go do this rescue operation. And the president of the United States is this Bible-thumping weirdo, right? But he's got this plan, and he's going to maneuver everybody this way and that to make his little Bible-thumper plan work. But Snake Plissken, he, he's the guy with the gun who makes things happen. And there's this, there's this bit right at the end of the movie where the president's plans are falling through. And it seems like there's no hope. And he throws up his hand and he clutches this Bible and he says, I, I can't think. I, I need to pray. Ah! And he runs out of the room. And then, of course, Snake Plissken is going to, with his eye patch, he's going to solve the problem with his gun because that's really the way you get things done. And I thought, what a beautiful caricature of what the unbelieving world thinks about people of faith. Uh, like we're actually up to no good and then when our plans fall through we really have no practical value because we got to run off to our mountain far 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 away from reality to, to hear the voice of the Lord and and all of this kind of stuff but but David is saying something something very very different here he's looking the scoffer in the eye and he's saying how can you say this in the Lord I take refuge now listen, not only do we have to address the scoffer, but, but we have to satisfy our own, our own questions in our heart for how we actually, practically, when things are going wrong, take refuge in the Lord. It is a skill. It is a spiritual discipline. And it's not by clutching your Bible, throwing up your hands and screaming, I need to go pray and running away. Look at verse 4. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. This is kind of an admission of what the scoffer is saying, right? Flee away to the mountain. Go, go, go. And the psalmist's response here is, is yeah, that's kind of true. God is in His holy temple in heaven, untouchable. Your arrows can't reach him. I think that it points to, if we're going to take refuge in the Lord, one thing that we have to be absolutely sure about is that whatever happens to us, God is untouchable. God won't fail. Ever. Period. There is nothing the world can do. There is nothing that the devil can do. All of the powers and the principalities arrayed against God will have no effect against him. God is king forever and ever. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. And that, adopted church, is where we start to take refuge in the Lord. We know that our God won't fail. He will never fail. But look at the second part of verse 4. His eyes see. His eyelids test the children of man. This is not just saying God's, God's up there and he'll never fail. He's good. He's also, he's also saying and God, God sees all of this. Have you ever been, this happened more back in the day when all you had was network television uh, or radio. We didn't have all the online stuff and that sort of stuff. You'd be sitting down and you'd be watching your show and all of a sudden this crazy sound would come over channel two or whatever. Beep! And there'd be this flash on the screen. And all of a sudden, your heart jumps a little bit because you know this is the warning system, right? But then this voice announces right away, this is a test. This is a test. And then you think to yourself, oh, good. They'll go right back to my show after this. No tornado, no nothing. Got it. Your test system works. The Lord, his eyes are seeing. His eyelids are testing the children of man. At some point, we can look the scoffer in the eye and say, how can you say this? Not only is God never going to be moved by your hardness of heart 
or all of the armies on the earth arrayed together in battle, never going to be able to touch him with all of their guns and bombs. But also, this is a test. And whatever I might be going through, I know that it is only a test. His eyes see all of this, and his eyelids test the children of man. Now, first time I read that, I thought, I, I thought maybe like his hand would test the children, or, or his eyelid? His eyelid tests the children of man? What's that saying? And I, I think that what it's saying is, is that when we use our eyelids, uh, it's either to block out everything, or it's to help us see. Like squinting, like narrowing, the narrowing of the eyes. And while both the psalmist and the scoffer are looking around at all of this craziness that, that the psalmist needs to take refuge in the Lord, God sees it as just finding out what's really going on, reading the label. Reading the fine print. Verse 5, the Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. I just want to say this to you. Oftentimes we can come into doubt as to whether or not we are righteous. And if we're going to take refuge in the Lord, one of the things that we have to do is be sure of his righteousness. Because when the Lord loves the righteous, he's not talking about the self-righteous, the people who do a bunch of good things because they think, hey, now, now this is what makes me good. This is what makes me on God's team. No, this is the people who rely on God's righteousness. The people who hang on to his righteousness and adopted church, his righteousness is secure. There is nothing that we can do to mar the righteousness of God. And he hands it to us freely. So while everything that's crazy is going on is only a test for the righteous, it's something very different for the unrighteous. It's the very hate of God. It's the very wrath of God. While the righteous person can be well assured. All of this is only a test. This is about me hanging on to my integrity, keeping my light, not allowing myself to let go of my Lord. But for the wicked, it's hell. Everything that goes wrong in an unrighteous person's life is hell on earth. Because they are the ones. This scoffer, in his own mind, he's his own God. But the problem is, everybody goes through hard, hard things. And for the unrighteous, it is not only proof that they are not God, it is the very penalty for not believing. So we could be walking through, side by side, a righteous man and an unrighteous man walking through the same circumstances. But the man who takes refuge in the Lord sees it as a purification, sees it as a trial, sees it as suffering, sees it as a test. And the other man sees it as a very affront to his religious belief to himself. He's angry at God. He's mad that God would dare question his own deity. How could you do this to me? But look here at, look here at verse 6. Let him, being God, rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. This is not just in this life, but in the life to come. That those who never accept God's righteousness, those who never take refuge in Him, they will not only be doomed to hell on earth and the realization that they in fact are not God, 
But in eternity, they will suffer so terribly. Sometimes, all the time, the world doesn't want to hear this. Evil doesn't want to hear this, that God's judgment is real. But brothers and sisters, if you want to take refuge in the Lord, be assured that His judgment is real. And the only way to escape God's judgment is to draw so near to Him, to be drawn into His very heart, which there is an open invitation to do. So if, if, if David here is saying, you can't say this to my soul because God is untouchable. You'll never beat God. And after all, I'm on his team. I'm taking refuge in him. This is just a test for me. But for you, scoffing brother, this is an incredible opportunity to turn from your sin, to repent, look at your future. It's very, very hot if you don't take refuge in the Lord with me. Then, the way that we live in this truth, the way that we continue to take refuge in the Lord is found here in verse 7. For the Lord is righteous, He loves righteous deeds, and the upright shall behold His face. If we're going to walk out taking refuge in the Lord, we must put our focus on God. The Lord is righteous. He's not just in heaven. He's not just going to win. He is good and right and true. We must focus on Him. We must put our attention fully on God. Forget the scoffer. Forget the circumstances. Those circumstances are not eternal. They never can be. They're circumstantial. But there is one who is eternal. Holy is He. His name is above all names. He is the healer. He is the forgiver. And He is the lover of our souls. His name is Jesus. The Lord is righteous. If we're going to walk this out, we also need to realize that the Lord, He's not only righteous, but He loves righteous deeds. As Paul says, the gift of salvation, it's, it's a gift of grace, not of works that no man should boast, but now we have been created for good works. If we're going to take refuge in the Lord, then no matter what is going wrong, we focus on Him and His righteousness and we act like He acts. What's going on in your marriage? No matter what's going on with your kids, no matter how broke you are, how sick you are, how much suffering you're going through, how addicted you are, how crushed and broken by the enemy you are, no matter how deep in grief you are, no matter how many miscarriages you've had, how many destructive relationships you are in, how much substance abuse you are lost in, or how much you are haunted by those half-remembered nightmares, you can do good. See, God doesn't call us to solve our problems. He does that. He calls us to do good. For He's righteous and He loves righteous deeds. That pleases God so much. When you're just hurting, when you're just broken, when you're limping around, one leg shorter than the other, just going in this loopy circle, not making any progress. When you're being kind to those people around you, you're doing good and you're saying, God, how can I be a blessing today? God, how can I do good today? See, that's what happens when we put our eyes on Him. Rather than on our circumstances, rather than getting lost in all of the pain, we put our eyes on Him and we say, He is righteous, He is my Lord, He's my healer and my forgiver, and He loves it when I do good. God, help me do good. Show me 
one today that I can do right by. This is how we take refuge in the Lord. Our works have something to do with us taking refuge in Him. Adopted church, be of good cheer. There is so much good work to do. There's no shortage of it. It's all over the place. No matter how down you are, how beat up you are, God has lots and lots and lots of work for you to do. Good work, satisfying work, fun work, work that you do hand in hand with Him. And lastly, if we're going to walk out taking refuge in the Lord, the upright shall behold his face. I said focus on God, and this is kind of like that. And in fact, the entire psalm is a chiasm, uh, which means there's symmetry to it. And the very first line, in the Lord I take refuge, is rhymed in theology and ideology with the last line. The upright shall behold his face. If we are going to take refuge in the Lord, we must get face to face with him. We must be in his presence. We must be staring into his eyes. To behold the face of God. I think you'll see something when you behold the face of God. Not only are you going to see the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you're going to notice that he notices you. And you are going to notice a very loving smile on his face as he watches you watching him. It's like this security blanket that we wrap around ourselves, we people of faith, knowing that the Lord loves us. He doesn't just tolerate us. He doesn't just put up with us. It's like a dad with his children. He loves us. And he allows us into his presence, not as needy beggars, but as the princes and princesses of the kingdom. In Exodus, there's this bold claim that Moses saw the face of God. And it was this extraordinary thing. Of course, that causes some confusion because the Bible also teaches us that God's face cannot be seen. But what Moses did in talking with God face to face is not something that's unusual for us believers. And if you have ever thought to yourself, like I have, I wish, I wish I could have been like Moses. Wow, I would love to talk with God face to face. I was thinking that earlier this week and God sort of went like, dude, we do. Actually, you're right. I come into your presence all the time. All the time I walk right into the presence of God, claim the blood of Jesus, and in I go. Lord, I need you so desperately. God, we have these things going on, and I love you so much, and here's the stuff I'm thankful for. And I'm just in there letting it all hang out right in front of God. We do it all the time, don't we? Yeah. Actually, that is the sweet spot. That's what we need to do, not just... Focus on God, not just do good, but behold His very face. It's available to us right now. Our lives right now can be face to face with God. Now, if you're face to face with God, how well are you listening to the scoffer? How much are you looking at the circumstances going, oh no, oh no, oh no. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Remember in the psalm, it's not the righteous man who's saying that, it's the scoffer who's saying that. Looking at all of the enemies and, and, and trembling, that's not the righteous man, that's the unrighteous man trying to intimidate the righteous man. But the righteous man is looking ahead at the future and beholding the very face of God. Now listen to me, if you are one of those people who thinks back 
to some spiritual golden age in the past and you think, I wish I could return, I tell you, people of God, our hope has never been in a golden age in the past, but a golden age that is yet to come. And Jesus ensures us that it's more and more every day. We have more than Moses had. We have the very presence of God. Let us then determine in our lives to focus on God who is righteous and in heaven and unmovable, who loves us, who is busy at work transforming this world. Let's roll up our sleeves, no matter how down we are, how suffering we are, and let us do good with our God, hand in hand. And let us live our lives face to face with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for what you have given to us. For the richness that we have in your presence. We have not secured this for ourselves, but simply received it from your righteous hand. God, your love for us is so amazing. It's so incredible. I cannot fathom that you, God, would die for me while I was still in a faraway country, while I was still lost in my sin. Jesus, help us to take refuge in you. Help us to be so secure in your presence looking forward to all of the work that is to be done and all of your glory that is to be had. In your name we pray. Amen.